Thank you all for being here today on this November 10th, uh, 2021. I am Nick Kenoki, the Director of Technology for the Asset Leadership Network, and I'm excited for this program with the National Academies. Before we get underway, I just want to thank our patron sponsors. Without their continued support, we would not be able to do programs like this uh, in our newsletter and other talks we do. And we also want to thank our organizational members. Uh, again, without their support, we couldn't do stuff like this. So really big thanks to all these organizations. It's a growing list. And if you'd like to make your organization a part of it, please reach out to us after the event. And with that, I will just say, if you're out there watching, uh, please send any comments, questions, uh, or feedback to the chat or use the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar. And we'll get those questions directed at our panel of experts. So uh, thanks, thanks for your participation. And with that, Mike Bordenero, Communications Director, uh, get us underway. Thank you, Nick, and thank you to everyone who is attending this, which is uh, our final web program with content. We're going to have another event on Friday to uh, uh, ask people to tell us uh, what we could be doing next, but uh, it's an honor to have uh, the National Academies, uh, Federal Facility Council, and Board on infrastructure and constructed environment members uh, talk with us. But before we get into that, uh, there's a couple things I wanna do. First, I wanna thank Nick. He's a new father and has been working his butt off through this whole conference. So thumbs up to you, Nick. And uh, the conference has been uh, focused on building on success. And we've had excellent presentations from uh, federal agencies and uh, private companies talking about their success and sharing their success. So we're very grateful for that. And um, we have them all recorded. Nick does an incredible job of putting them up and uh, editing highlights there on our website. And um, we started this program with, uh, or this conference with a program that was titled Advancing Equity with Infrastructure asset man leadership. And uh, it's great to be tying up with uh, the Board on Infrastructure and Constructed Environment and Federal Facility Council. Um, and our themes of leadership, equity, and value, certainly the National Academies has been providing leadership, showing how to share equity and to create value for uh, the federal government and uh, the entire country. So, uh, it's uh, our pleasure to have uh, Cameron Osvig, who is the director of both the Federal Facility Council and the Board on Infrastructure and Constructed Environment, uh, kick this off by uh, introducing himself and uh, the other panelists. So, and Cameron, thank you for so many years of uh, support of the Asset Leadership Network. We love when we're able to get together at your facilities, but we appreciate that you're uh, participating in this web format also. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank, thank you, ALN, for, for a great program that you've put on over the last weeks and months. Um, I think it's you've always been a, a strong supporter of a complimentary supporter of the activities that the Federal Facilities Council is interested in, in helping the federal government uh, manage, um, effectively manage the facilities that it owns. Um, I'm joined today, um, my name is Cameron Osvig. I'm the director of the Federal Facilities Council, as well as the director of the Board on Infrastructure and Constructed Environment at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Um, the Board on Infrastructure and Constructed Environment does studies in the areas of the built environment and infrastructure and how it impacts um, and various impacts and policies in, in those areas. Uh, some of the areas that we have studies right now include a um, reuse of plastics in infrastructure applications, in capital planning of, the, of NIST, in a forensic failure analysis of the Arecibo telescope, we are doing a study on the peer review of DOE appliance standards and methodologies. We are reviewing the effectiveness uh, of project and program management at the Department of Energy's Environmental Management Program, and also um, developing a workshop on enhancing urban sustainability and infrastructure. 
In addition to what the board undertakes, we also, um, uh, what our longest standing activity is the Federal Facilities Council, which supports the federal government and federal agencies in the management of um, the infrastructure in the design, in the programming, in the management, and then the disposition of the facilities that it owns. And we cover a number of um, topics, including um, workforce issues, uh, design and construction, operations and maintenance, technology, um, cyber and physical security um, through, through our activities. I'm joined today by Dorothy Robine, who's uh, by three members of the BICE, and also by the chair of the Federal Facilities Council. Um, I'm, firstly, um, I'm joined by Dorothy Robine, who's a non-resident senior fellow at the Boston University Institute for Sustainable Energy, where she writes on public policy issues related to clean energy innovation and federal agency management. From 2009 to 2014, uh, Dorothy served in the Obama administration as the deputy undersecretary for the Department of Defense with overall management for US military bases. And later she served as the head of the US um, uh, G GSA in the public building service. I'm also joined by the chair of the Federal Facilities Council, Jim Raspoli, who's a licensed professional engineer and professor of practice at North Carolina State University. He also serves as a senior executive advisor to Project Time and Cost and uh, was a senior uh, executive in the Department of Energy um, Office of Engineering and Construction and Management and later served as the Assistant Secretary of Energy from 2005 to 2008. Prior to that, Jim was the, um, served in the US Navy, retiring as a captain in the Civil Engineering Corps. You know, he has developed and teaches two graduate engineering courses at North Carolina State um, and initiated curriculum uh, in the graduate engineering concentration in facilities engineering. And lastly, we have Jack Dempsey, who's the director at Definitive Logic uh, and an internationally recognized expert in asset management who serves as a convener of the ISO Technical Committee, TC251 Product Improvement Work Group for Asset Management Standards. Jack served 21 years as an active duty Coast Guard officer um, in roles such as construction management, facilities management, running and design and construction offices, um, staff assignments and enterprise change management. Jack served as the vice chair for a study that I will reference today. So I welcome you all. Thank you all for being here. Um, sorry for the last, um, for the, the bit of introductions, but it's important that I think that we understand everybody's background. Yes. Um, the, over the last 30 years, the Federal Facilities Council has issued a number of reports in support of the federal government in planning, design, operating, and management of facilities. Much of the content of, the re of these reports suggested or supported the idea that regular investment in facilities would minimize overall life cycle costs. While the argument is well supported, Scarce resources and transforming missions and other factors force changes to dependable funding plans and lead to, and lead to individual facility sustainment rather than strategic improvement and renewal of portfolios of facilities. While understanding inventory portfolio and condition of facilities is important, the Federal Facilities Council recognized that crying about the business case that facilities are in poor condition and the size of the deferred maintenance dollar value doesn't resonate when it comes to driving organizational mission. Our recent report uh, titled A Strategy to Renew Federal Facilities refocuses facilities as assets to the missions through integration. That is that the facilities provide value to the ultimate agency goal. And this is done through implementing an asset management system approach as prescribed with a standard like ISO 55,000. Capital, it's also done through capital planning policy and risk management tools to link cause and effect of facility investment to mission outcome, access to capital and budgeting structures which enable timely and effective investment, and communication plans that includes leadership and informed decision makers on the impacts of short and long-term investment in infrastructure. Whether the mission is launching uh, space vehicles or doing applied research or preparing soldiers for the battlefield or preserving natural and cultural resources, facilities are required. 
it's the endeavor of the BICE and of the Board on Infrastructure and Constructive Environment and the Federal Facilities Council to engage activities that optimize strategies given constrained resources to identify best delivery methodologies for infrastructure to meet organizational goals and objectives, utilize data from sensing, from information and communication technologies in conjunction with descriptive and predictive and uh, decision-making tools and account for inherent uncertainties, and then to explore the potential impact of investment choices, including recent trends to make equity central to sustainability efforts. What's important to the FFC today and some of our topics that we're focusing on include cybersecurity of facilities and building control systems, workforce issues, including the supply chain of our future workforce and facilities and our skilled trades, driving technology and innovation and in facility management, and what does the future of the facilities footprint look like in the federal government following this great experiment of remote working? And so how do we return back to work and what's the federal footprint gonna look like? Uh, I'm excited to uh, talk about these issues today and, and to have these, these members with us. Um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and, and start with, um, with Jim as, as a former, uh, Navy, Navy engineer and appointed uh, senior executive service officer with DOE. What are per some perspectives that you have in, in leadership uh, and successful management of federal facility installations? Well, well, Cameron, thank you. First, let me thank uh, Cameron and the National Academies, as well as Mike and the Asset Leadership Network for putting this on today and, and hosting this panel. Uh, I just like to share a few thoughts on leadership. Uh, as Cameron mentioned, as a member of the BICE, I also chair the Federal Facilities Council, which is comprised of about 25 federal agencies. And it's an organization, uh, as some of you may know, uh, who know me, uh, that I've participated in for quite a while since I was a, uh, a, a young captain in the Navy. Uh, representing NAVFAC on two separate different occasions. And then later on uh, as a, uh, both an SES and an appointee in the Department of Energy. And just uh, an unsolicited plug for the FFC for federal agencies. It is just an outstanding forum for executives to convene and, and, and have a forum to discuss the types of issues that Cameron just ran through that are self-identified by the agencies that are represented and are members of the Federal Facilities Council. So with regard to the theme of uh, leadership, equity, and value, I, I guess my perspective would be that you're not going to have equity and value without leadership. It has to begin with leadership. And really, even if you're a consultant and your own leadership wants to have and incorporate sustainability, equity, value, uh, it still has to be driven by the owner. If the owner is not willing and eager to do this, then basically the leadership is not there to make it happen. Um, and, and I would just share with, with you as in these brief opening comments that the American Society of Civil Engineers has been looking at uh, addressing the problem of not having enough money to maintain the infrastructure and facilities that we all have, whether they be federal or private sector, and, and, and has developed a guide, if you will, that considers that to be sustainable, uh, the, the, the facilities must consider the community, the impact on the community, both from an equity point of view, but also an economic benefit. Is it going to be a benefit or a detriment to the community? You have to consider the energy usage of the facility or infrastructure solution that you're proposing and the environmental impact on, on the natural world, if you will, as well as on the community and the people that, that are involved. And then what, what is added in the ASCE perspective of sustainability is the cost to the owner, the life cycle cost to the owner. Typically we spend maybe three, four, five years planning and building something. And then that something is usually around for 50 or more years. And, and the days of choosing lowest first cost are not necessarily in alignment with sustainability. Because if the owner, whoever the owner is, cannot afford to properly sustain that facility, 
so that it remains a positive asset to the community, the employees, and the nation, uh, then it is not a successful project. So it's one thing to keep asking for more money, which we do because we need more money, but this concept of sustainability that includes life cycle costs is an opportunity for leaders to demand that we drive the cost, the life cycle cost down so that we don't keep adding to the future requirement for increasing and, and never, never stopping increase in funding. So uh, this all begins with leadership. Uh, I, I think that uh, I have heard on several panels, I'm on a current one with the National Academies, we've heard from several experts that have actual evidence where if, if owners take a strong lead, you're far more likely to have success in the endeavor, whether it's the initial construction or the long-term operation and maintenance. So uh, you will find that, that from my background, both as a commissioned officer in the facility side of the Navy, as well as a civilian in the Department of Energy, many years working for owner organizations, I am truly an advocate for strong leadership beginning with the owner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the Asset Leadership Network would like to say amen to that. <laughs> uh, uh, excellent. Uh, Karen, who are you going to have speak next? Um, well, I, I was going to say, you know, much of Dorothy's work is focused on energy innovation and improving energy performance in, in the federal government. Um, Maybe she could provide some insights. Uh, I, I actually, you know, if she wants to talk about that work, yeah. some insights on how technology and innovation can be deployed. I, I'm actually gonna having having watched this uh, uh, this event all morning and a little bit of yesterday. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, talk about something different. And, Perfect. And I'm, I'm gonna be a bit contrarian because um, I don't think I don't think I don't think it is all about. I don't think it is mostly about leadership. You saw this morning, you saw the caliber of leadership at the State Department in, o in OBO and in the domestic office. And you see that in DOD and you see that at GSA, it takes more than leadership. So let me, let me, let me, um, let me lay out the problem, the reasons for what I see as the key problem. And then maybe I can talk separately about solutions so I don't go on too long. Um, I think, let me condense it to, I think federal facilities are starved for resources by any measure and you simply can't ignore that. And let me start by, let me just for context, we're talking about 350,000 buildings, 3 billion square feet of space. That is the federal facility portfolio. That's five or six times as much of, as all the commercial real estate in Manhattan. Federal facilities use as much energy as New England, as New Zealand. They are the largest energy consumer in the, in the world. So it's a very, very large footprint. And predictably, they do not get the resources that they need. I mean, that's that's a problem in the private sector. It's a much bigger problem in the in the public sector. And I and I think you have to keep repeating the, the deferred maintenance number, $165 billion. That's a year old number. So it's probably upwards of 175 billion on the GAO high risk list. One of the, uh, uh, the person in one of the military services, I won't say which one, emailed me after something I wrote say, saying this. And he said, you know, senior officers would never allow a weapon system to get in the condition of some of our, our facilities. So it is, a, it is a structural problem. Let me talk about three reasons for the problem. And then later, maybe I'll, if I get a chance, I'll talk about some of this, what I see as structural solutions. The first, the first problem, and, and Thad Allen just summarized it beautifully this morning. I will use this, this quote, he said, Shore facilities don't compete well against cutters and aircraft. I mean, that kind of says it all. You've got, you've got operational needs, and this is really evident in DOD, uh, operational needs, and, and then you have buildings. And historically in DOD, the, the operational guys took money out of the, out of the installation pot for 
for urgent operating needs. The services stood up installation commands to try to um, address that problem. So there would be somebody in there in the budget process fighting for it. It helped, it hasn't solved the problem. In the case of GSA, there is a federal building fund that consists of about 10 or $11 billion a year that federal agencies contribute in the form of the rent they pay in GSA buildings. Congress has, over the last decade, they have taken out, diverted, raided about a billion dollars a year out of the federal building fund to pay for treasury salaries and other non-GSA activities. So, um, uh, so you, that's, that's, the, that's the first reason that facilities don't compete well against other, other needs seen as more urgent. Um, second, agency, federal agencies have too much stuff. They have too many buildings. They don't need 350,000 buildings and 3 billion square feet of space. BRAC is base realignment and closure, single most effective uh, uh, efficiency measure the Department of Defense has, has ever undertaken, four rounds of BRAC. And I think any DOD CFO will, will tell you that. Um, we haven't had a BRAC since 2005. Congress considers it a four, four letter word. Uh, there is now a civilian BRAC, but it's only certain agencies. It's, you know, it's a, the equivalent of a DOD BRAC that doesn't include the Navy or the Air Force. Um, and as, as Cameron uh, alluded to, the world is going to be really different post-COVID. I don't think we're, I mean, I think it, it, either we're going to use that as a, um, as a point of departure for getting rid of a lot of the stuff that the federal government doesn't need, um, or it's the problem is gonna get a lot worse. You need structural solutions. I, uh, I'll, I can go down my list, but I'll do that. I'll do that later. Can, can I ask yeah. a, a question? All right, so leadership isn't uh, the only answer. And so when you're talking about energy use, it's like, everybody's got to turn the lights off when they leave the room. I mean, that's everybody. That's not just a leadership issue. That's what I thought in my mind, but could you explain a little bit more about how it's not just a leadership issue? Well, I, when I say not a leadership issue, I'm talking, I'm talking about facility management. So I'm, gotcha. not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about energy. That's also right. true for energy, but I'm, I'm talking about the bigger problem of facility management, of which energy management is a is a piece, but not necessarily the biggest, the biggest piece. Yeah. And, and clearly uh, the rating of uh, the GSA fund is not a leadership issue. That's just outright pirating. It, and... it, you know, that particular subcommittee of Senate appropriations is chaired by uh, Chris Van Hollen, Center for Maryland, outstanding. And I'm hoping this will change under his uh, leadership because he really, being this, the Center for Maryland, knows he has a lot of federal facilities in his state. Uh -huh. But that subcommittee gets a small piece of the overall appropriations pie when that initial allocation takes place and and that subcommittee has to spread it across a bunch of things including some really high priority uh, treasury IRS activities so this has been going on for a decade um, and we'll see whether it uh, it changes there are some potential structural fixes to that but I think I think we're getting in the weeds when we start talking about about that okay. Jack Dempsey, opening thoughts? You want to re re respond to either one of our earlier? Sure. And, and, and first of all, again, I want to echo, um, you know, it, it's an honor to be here, um, a member of the BICE, and really do appreciate ALN's uh, leadership in asset management um, and, and holding these forums. It's a great opportunity to share, um, you know, insightful thoughts and, and ideas about ultimately how to, how to make things better. Um, and of course, in alignment with the, uh, the mission of the, of the BICE, the Building uh, um, uh, Board on Infrastructure and Constructed Environment, um, it, it's really to try to uh, support uh, the federal government, you know, both uh, the legislative and executive branches, um, and, and provide advice. So, um, 
So it's it's kind of a really nice nice place and kind of echoing some of the things that Jim brought together. Um, it's a great place where leaders and um, innovators can get together, share these ideas, uh, debate these ideas with, with an interest of, of kind of influencing public policy. Um, I'll, I'll kind of pile on a little bit. Um, I, 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 I strongly support um, both the perspectives of, of Dorothy and Jim in, in their evaluation of, of the problem. There, there's certainly clear agreement on um, this is kind of um, a big problem, a problem um, sometimes bigger than uh, individual agencies can really um, get their hands around. I mean, just the enormity of the deferred maintenance backlog is staggering. Uh, the impacts that it has on mission, as Jim and Dorothy both outlined, are uh, um, credible um, and, and real. Um, to highlight a little bit of the recent study that's going to be coming out at the National Academies, and Cameron, you introduced this, uh, Strategies to Renew Federal Facilities. Um, that study really looked at, you know, what's the landscape, what's going on, and, and why do we have these chronic types of problems? The, the study um, focused a little bit on the how-to um, to do this and elements of that, um, and of course the study will, it will be released here in the near future, um, really focused on there's a discipline of thought in terms of how to make good investment decisions. So there's an emphasis on how do you get things rolling? It's about making good budget decisions and that requires a lot, a lot of information, good inventory data, good data and knowledge about the performance of facilities, whether it's be from an energy perspective or a condition perspective, um, you know, Dorothy's point on, you know, what's going to happen after COVID and the reliance on facilities in a certain capacity, you know, with telecommute strategies, um, a dramatic change of how things are going. But, but all this kind of comes down to what's the business case for facilities. And really the, the basis of where that starts is through uh, the communications of budget. So the strategies to renew federal facilities and renew is really about uh, making sure that they're um, mission ready, uh, available to support the needs of the nation and specifically in support of agency needs. So, so the strategy really focuses on uh, the how-to, a disciplined approach to asset management. It, it highlights the value of standards such as ISO 55000, which provides a construct to understand how this discipline gets applied. But it gets to, back to points that Dorothy was raising as well. It's, it's a business case. Is it relevant? Is it, is it rational and is it impactful? So, so the strategy um, looked at and, and called to some people's attention, um, some recent uh, very good policy coming out of OMB uh, to highlight uh, OMB uh, memorandum M, so it's M20 TAC3, which focus on the improvement of the real property capital plan, which is building on existing policies, OMB circular A11 and the capital programming guide. So there's a lot of structure and infrastructure kind of in place. And it point, points to emphasis that agencies need to clearly articulate the business case for facilities and how that supports the mission and ultimately the, the needs of the nation. Uh, another policy that's coming out of OMB that was uh, a subject of attention of the study was OMB memorandum, it's M20 TAC 10. And that builds on um, uh, the strategies uh, for the efficient use of real property. So uh, th that is, um, takes it kind of a little bit of a higher level and saying, you know, collectively, the plans that the federal government has, uh, Dor to Dorothy's point, addressing these issues of uh, unfunded liabilities, that being um, you know, deferred maintenance backlog, and ultimately also the, the consumption of facilities, about $70 billion of budget a year. And that's you know, effectively turning lights on, um, flushing toilets and keeping things uh, you know, generally operational for the needs of agencies and, and ultimately the public um, is a quite a complex activity. But these strategies um, and these, these policies are, are doing a good job. But when you look at um, GAO, um, a recent GAO study, GAO uh, 19 TAC 57, it highlights also that the federal government is doing some good things, but there's more work to be done. And I think, um, you know, I mean, ultimately this is what this, this study is all about is trying to figure out what some of those how-to um, aspects. Um, breaking it down a little bit, it's you know have a systematic approach of how you're evaluating risk and communicating with stakeholders. It involves uh, developing um, plans and strategies that are clear and articulate in terms of um, describing that business case. It talks about um, the better use of data and information, why that's critical and is today. There's been definitely lots of improvements in that area. 
but more improvements are, are needed. But ultimately, it's after you have all that content, it's are you making an impact? Are you decisive in decision making and helping others, you know, particularly Congress or other um, executives in the federal, um, uh, on the executive side, understand the implications of decisions, or in some cases, the lack of a decision and the impacts that has on American pro prosperity. So um, really do appreciate uh, Jim and Dorothy's points, uh, fully support them, and uh, looking forward to the study being released that, uh, that others can maybe gain some additional insights on. Excellent. No, go ahead, Dorothy. Okay, I I, I want to respond to to uh, Jack's comments on the budget proposals uh, because I forgot to mention the federal budget process as being one of the one of the key reasons for the the situation we find ourselves in. And I and I I say I think the the OMB proposal or the uh, proposal initially put out by the Trump administration. Um, uh, uh, and it has not yet passed Congress. Um, I, I think that's a step forward. I think it's a ban it's a band aid. It's a drop in the bucket. Let me say let me say what the problem is. The federal and Mike, you alluded to this this morning when you talked about the international accrual budgeting. We have federal government has a cash budget cash approach to budgeting. We do not have a capital budget. We do not treat capital investment any differently than we treat operating expenses. Um, there have historically been workarounds for GSA and DOD to allow them to acquire new buildings in effect through a mortgage process by paying year by year and then owning the building at the end. They can't do that any longer. They don't have the, the ability to do that. If they need to acquire a new building or build a new one, they have to accumulate a series of uh, uh, of surpluses year year by year, and th this is just imp impossible. Um, a commission looked at this in 1998. Should the federal government have a capital budget? They recognized the particular problem for real property, and they proposed this this idea of a of a capital fund. The federal government would set aside money for a capital fund, uh, and that is what. Um, it is being proposed. The Trump administration linked it to something stupid, and so it didn't get through Congress. I think it will get through Congress. It will create a $10 billion pot of money that is self-refreshing, but $10 billion is a drop, is a drop in the bucket. Yeah, I just want, want to highlight on, on that as well, because I mean, it, it's interesting how policy kind of shapes the argument, I mean, effectively, the, the policy talks about, you know, the alignment with the appropriations and, and authorized use of funding. And that's uh, uh, critical and important. And obviously, you know, Congress having the purse strings has an interest to observe um, the expenditure of, of those funds. But um, embedded in that process or that kind of perspective is as, as Dorothy kind of calls out, um, the ability to, to not really fully understand capital, the life cycle uh, requirements of capital investments. And, and in this case, talking about real property um, in uh, section 83 of OMB Circular A11, it defines a, an accounting architecture that's very good about evaluating how funds are being uh, expended. So when agencies pass audits, uh, they're demonstrating that they're um, making use of the funds in ways that are legally um, um, articulated to them, and, and they're doing that. What it fails to do, and effectively what's impossible to do, is to run a balance sheet on the consumption of costs by facilities and to evaluate that. So uh, embedded within the um, architectures of policy is a limitation of being able to evaluate um, uh, the management of capital across life cycles. And, and to, to Dorothy's point, it really does complicate, um, you know, the ability of federal agencies to be responsive to good management practices. And I think there's a, there's an echo effect that happens uh, throughout the life cycle that, uh, that those who are active in this area uh, fully understand, but uh, it's clear those um, outside of kind of the, the facility management uh, area um, don't yet fully appreciate or understand the significance of how an accounting structure can really limit good decision-making. 
Jim, do you think there's any way of addressing this? I think I, <clears throat> for starters, I, I appreciate the comments that Jack and Dorothy have made. And uh, I think the challenge for federal agencies is directly tied to, I think Jack called it the accounting, but I would raise it a level to what Dorothy mentioned as well, which is the budget. Uh, the budget, there is nothing worse, no matter whether you're managing facilities, a portfolio of facilities, or a weapon system, there is nothing worse than a budget that goes up and down and up and down. Because generally what, what will happen is that we're kind of required to make longer term commitments on some portion of our portfolio. And if a subsequent budget goes down unexpectedly, well, sometimes that there's a portion of our budget that's already committed. And so we have to look, where can we go to, to extract things that really need to be done that can wait another year? And it just exacerbates the problem. So I think, you know, I, I agree with Dorothy and Jack that it's not just leadership, it's, it's a structural issue in the way we operate. Uh, you know, I think, uh, Jack, you said it's, uh, we look, or Dorothy said, we look at it as, a, it's, it, there's no capital budget, it's all year by year. And I can remember many, many meetings with OMB where you would try to persuade someone that, you know, the, this is better for the life cycle, but the higher first cost basically results in a no-go for that approach. Uh, and so it's a very complicated process. I think those not in the federal budget, uh, not in the federal agencies may not realize that you first have to convince your own boss within the agency, such as the secretary uh, for the budget you need. Then the next step is often you wind up being the one to go over to OMB and get it through OMB. And then eventually it has to get into the president's budget and it may or it may not get into the president's budget. And then you wind up with the Congress dealing with it as well. So. Certainly, I would agree fully that a big part of the challenge for federal agencies is the very structure that we work with. Uh, I don't know that there's any quick solution for that, uh, but I think part of it has to be that the leaders in the facilities game have to be sure that their appropriate secretary or assistant secretary or undersecretary is fully aware of the impacts of budget decisions on the portfolio facilities. Uh, I think some of us have been more uh, more blessed than others, if you will. I, you know, the secretary I worked for was himself an engineer who came out of a a, a basically a facilities oriented background. Uh, but you know, it, it, these people change uh, with every cycle, and we just have to do what we can as leaders to have the appropriate influence on the next level up to support the budgets that we need, and also the policies that we need, which Dorothy alluded to. You know, alternative ways of getting things done than just money in the budget. So those are just some quick thoughts, Mike. Okay, so uh, this has been a very clear articulation of the big picture problem. And since we can't solve that in this discussion, um, I'd like to just say thank you for helping us articulate this. We're recording this and we'll be able to spread this uh, discussion out. I think awareness of it is probably the best thing that the Asset Leadership Network can help with. And, and then I'd like to talk about some other things that I think are uh, fundamental in asset management. And that's breaking down the silos between the different types of assets. Organizations get large and in order to effectively operate, they have to cre create divisions, facilities, IT, personal property, fleets, et cetera. It just makes sense to operate that way. But now with the tools and processes that are available, there's ways of getting information about all of those assets rolled into a dashboard for uh, leaders to be able to make more real-time decisions. And I wonder what you all think about um, the ability for information management to help break down silos, even if it's between you know, infrastructure and buildings, because there's a building, but a road needs to come up to that building for anybody to be able to access it. And it needs electricity and it needs water and wastewater. You know, really can't think of them separate. I can jump in first and they're not uh, directly to the examples you just gave, Mike, but one example that comes to mind is the silo between worker safety 
and uh, the maintenance and repair activity and operational activities of a typical large installation. Uh, you know, the, the, the days of thinking that safety is off to the side and you, the leader can focus on mission and the superintendents and the foreman can focus on mission and, and safety is an adjunct. Uh, I think that the, the current state of uh, technology enables us to build a dashboard that can put them side by side because safety is, is intrinsic to getting the, the, the mission accomplished. Uh, another one that, that uh, is, uh, has come to light over the past two years, thanks to Cameron's leadership and, and the FSC is this burgeoning area of cybersecurity. Uh, you know, it, it has been made amply evident that this is more than what an IT department can solve or an IT organization within an agency can solve because the things that, that can affect not our pocketbook, the, the, the bank accounts and the, and the credit card accounts, they affect the pocketbook, but the things that can affect life safety, like you know, uh, adding too much of a, of, a, of a chemical to our drinking water, those are called control systems. Those are operational technology. They are certainly things that IT people know about, but we need to be the ones that, that take hold of that challenge and drive solutions because the, the, the risks are great, but the consequences are even greater. And so those are, are two examples of silos that I think we need to address taking advantage of the technology that's available, both the, safe, the integration of safety and everything we do, but also how do we posture ourselves and our assets for better security from cyber attack. Cameron, can you uh, add a little bit of information about uh, what you've learned uh, about cybersecurity? Sure, Mike, thanks. Uh, yeah, so we run some a number of activities around um, what is the facility manager's role in and, and trying to understand better what the facility management and role in cybersecurity. Um, oftentimes it seems like, oh, uh, identifying cybersecurity as an IT function or IT identifies the building controls as a, as a building function. And so, you know, Mike, some of that is the silos that you're talking about, putting those silos together to understand the risks um, and impacts to uh, a potential cyber attack. The Federal Facilities Council actually on our website has a, a really great proceedings document from a workshop that we had around cybersecurity of operational technology um, that we held earlier this fall. And I would invite people to go and look at those proceedings which describe the skills that the workforce needs, the facilities workforce needs and, and is currently lacking in ways that, that uh, the facilities uh, operations um, offices and administration can get involved in, or, or should be involved in, in the cybersecurity. Okay, um, uh, Scott from uh, the Department of Defense uh, says that you wouldn't be surprised if we have a cybersecurity force uh, in the future. That's an interesting concept. So, um, uh, Dorothy, yeah. uh, we, we started our conference uh, with a program called Advancing Equity with Infrastructure Asset Leadership, because we knew that there was going to be some big infrastructure bills coming, and we wanted to make sure that the concept of equity was uh, considered in the expenditure of these vast amount of funds and that we don't repeat some of the same mistakes that we did in the past. One of our advancing equity with asset leadership members, Hugh Sinclair from the uh, Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission is a font of excellent statements. And he said, structural problems require structural solutions. If you were infrastructure queen for the day, how, how <laughs> well, would you? <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, can I answer a different question? Because I didn't get a chance to, uh, say a couple of things. I didn't get to talk oh, about this. Please, please. Too. Okay. So I laid, out, I laid out a contrarian view of the problem, but I didn't, and, and I wanna hit on a couple things and I'll try to incorporate cyber. Okay, okay, so 
one thing you see happening in, in DOD, and it, it is limited, it is a very positive thing, it is a positive way of addressing the structural budget issue, is turning assets into services. So, and the best example of this is housing privatization. The military, DOD, privatized 220,000 units of military family housing over this course of, of two decades. It has recently been in the news for some problems. That those will be dealt with. This is a very successful story. The services were not maintaining their military family housing in the late 90s. It had become a serious barrier to retention and recruitment of, of, of uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen. They privatized it, privatized meaning 50 year leases for private entities like, uh, like Hunt and Lend Lease to, to, to renovate it. It changed the incentive structure because these private entities had to compete to have um, military families use their housing allowance to live in that housing. They could alternatively go into town and live. So it created the right incentives and it really transformed military housing in a very positive way. We took our eye off the, off the ball uh, about uh, seven or eight years ago. And, and so there have been, there've been issues. It's, nobody's talking about going back to the old way. That concept of turning assets into services. So somebody else with, with the budgetary discipline and wherewithal to manage this, these valuable assets can do it and do it better. And the, and the federal government acquires it as a service. Now that can run into problems with OMB. There have been certain carve outs for ha privatized housing, for certain forms of energy contracting. As a general matter, OMB doesn't like that approach because it, it, they see it as a form of borrowing money. You are entering into a, a 10, 20, 25 year contract with an entity and you're paying high, high finance rates. But that's a really important um, tool that needs to be used much more broadly. Um, it, it may or may not be part of electrification of the federal fleet. Um, I think it depends on how much money there is in the infrastructure bill and the Build Back uh, Better bill. Um, just on, on cyber, let me, and here, so DOD is trying to do some really innovative stuff on their military bases to make them more energy resilient because they're very vulnerable to the uh, commercial electric grid. And they have been a real pioneer in the use of uh, microgrids. And they started demonstrating advanced microgrid technology 10 years ago when it first began coming out of the laboratory, coming out of the garage, uh, not yet on the shelf. Um, and DOD is now in a position to start deploying microgrids widely. And when I say microgrids, I mean together with uh, solar and large scale uh, storage um, uh, facilities. Um, and, and because of the number of military bases there are, DOD and their size, uh, DOD can make a contribution both through by being an early adopter of advanced technology and through the scale of its potential purchase of microgrid technology, large scale energy storage technology. Cyber is a real impediment to trying to do that. Um, now, people are trying to attack the federal government. So, I mean, obviously we have to be really, really careful. I think what I have a problem with is that the it, facilities are not getting the priority treatment from CIOs when it comes to cyber issues. It's sort of, it, it's the, the endemic problem that facilities face, particularly in, in DOD. Um, so I think cyber needs to be a, um, it, it needs to be a higher priority, it, big problem, but it's preventing us. The army doesn't meter most of its buildings and they say it's cyber, that may or may not be the reason, but you know, that's the argument they made. You can't manage something if you can't, if you can't measure. Mm -hmm. Jack, you have any insights? Yeah, I mean, it, it's fascinating when you when you look at all the different areas when you talk about facilities and the management of facilities um, that have to be considered. It, um, 
I mean, I think in complement to, to these issues um, is an area where I think where asset management does have a role and more specifically kind of the uh, disciplined approach to asset management. I'll get, put another plug in uh, for the ISO 55000 standard because it, it is the only standard um, that's out there that really kind of looks at the asset. To Dorothy's point, I really like the way she characterized it. When you talk about facilities is really kind of the services, you know, there's lots of ways to probably characterize that, but it's, I, mean, I, I like to think of it as like the Michelin enabling function. Facilities are designed, built, and maintained for a purpose. And it's really that purpose is the basis for the business case for its their continuance, renewal, sustainment, um, all, all of that. Um, when we talk about an asset management system, we're really talking about kind of the, the core competencies of the organization and its ability to um, identify these issues, understand them, communicate with the stakeholders that are involved, um, kind of boil it down into, you know, objective, measurable performances so we can evaluate exactly where we are and start figuring out where we need to go. And then beyond that is also what are the resources and strategies that need to be implemented? Um, I, I think the, uh, I agree with uh, Dorothy, the, the, the PPV um, strategy with housing is a great success, but also can recognize when it's not uh, an elemental part of the thought process. You know, sometimes we lose our eye on the ball and um, certain um, locations have suffered because of, um, you know, the discontinuance of needed sustainment requirements. Uh, I'm sure Jim could list out dozens of examples where similar types of decisions were made related to energy um, and improvements to the energy use and ultimately the ultimate effectiveness of, of a federal agency. So. I look at an asset management system as part of this answer. Um, it's, not, it's not the sexy side of the story, but if organizations have the disciplined approach of supporting communications, good data, good information, using that in terms of an effective business case that's involving people, um, we're learning um, how to make better investment decisions. Um, yeah. That is um, a, a focus of an upcoming study that we've been talking about here. Um, and I hopefully, um, uh, get some attention because I think it's an underpinning for the solutions that both Dorothy and, and Jim are, yeah. are highlighting. Yeah. And you I, know, there's another aspect too that, that relating to housing and also when you think of energy and uh, uh, allowing private entities to come on board and implement energy savings uh, without a first cost to the host, uh, the, the cost being recouped over a period of years. Uh, the interesting thing about, about those approaches, as we've learned in the Federal Facilities Council, is that none of the agencies don't all have the same authorities. It's really amazing, as somebody who's been in the federal government for most of my professional career, that each agency has its own committees that basically authorize and appropriate for them in Congress. And they all have different authorities on what they can and can't do with budget flexibilities. And it's an amazing thing when you're at a Federal Facilities Council Oversight Committee meeting and you hear these different representatives from different agencies talk about, well, how are you doing that? And you know that other agency has the authorities to do what they're doing and other agencies don't have those authorities. So it just goes to show how this is a, an intricate web, if you will, of, of policy that challenges any leadership organization. When you talk about the policies, the budget ups and downs, uh, you know, you, you have to really uh, have good equilibrium, I think, to, 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 to keep, keep up with the opportunities and take advantage of what you can do. And, and, and we have had successes, as Cameron can attest, where some agencies learned of something in the FFC meeting and went and, and worked with their staffers on the Hill to get those types of authorities. And, and so it's not widespread, but it can be done to enable some of these opportunities like Dorothy described and the energy one to be taken advantage of by different agencies. It was, uh, yeah, to, speaking of authorities, it was interesting this morning when you had the State Department talking, Mike, um, that the OBO has a working capital fund that they use for, for their investment, capital investments in facilities and their domestic operations were looking to mimic that, that authority that OBO has for the domestic investment. And, and similarly, in the cash approach to budgeting that, that Dorothy and, and Jack have both talked about as, a, as an impediment, 
to um, to efficient and effective uh, investments in in renewing federal facilities, um, a capital working fund that that agencies could could use a, a, a working capital fund like OBO has. Um, it was just interesting within an agency itself to see that there were two different sort of authority approaches in, in programming for buildings over multi-year. Yeah. yeah, that uh, is a perfect highlight of what uh, Jim was discussing. Um, so we've done a really good job of uh, articulating uh, problems and uh, the National Academies is an excellent place for solutions. So are there other things that you'd like to share? Uh, Jack talked about the upcoming study. Um, please let us know what other things you have going on. We'd like to uh, uh, promote them and try to get uh, more people involved. Dorothy, is there anything in particular that you are excited about that no. the Vice is doing? I want to just, I do want to plug uh, ISO 55,000 uh, and say that I, I think we're, that falls in the category of what I call struct structural solutions. So I, I would put BRAC in that category to help agencies get rid of the too much stuff they have or BRAC-like mechanisms, housing privatization, and other things that turn an asset into a service that can be acquired from somebody in a position to manage it more capably than the federal government. Uh, scoring reform, reform of the budget scoring process. You don't have to change everything in order to tweak the scoring rules. Um, uh, the working capital fund. And then I think the uh, ISO 55,000. Um, I remember a, in one of my counterparts in DOD, he was on the operational side, him saying to me, you know, it used to be really easy to steal money from your office, but you have more data now. It's much harder for me to steal money from you. And I think that's where something like ISO 55000 comes in. I mean, the more transparent and the more data-based that facility management process can be, the harder it is or other, other activities to, to steal money from it. While you're talking about ISO 55000, we have a question from organizational member uh, Cecilia Mowat of Strategies and Sight, uh, talking about, uh, asking about how stakeholder management can uh, reduce unintended consequences of infrastructure or facility projects. And, uh, she mentions that uh, we have a, an overlay to ISO 55004.2, which requires involvement of all relevant stakeholders. And does that uh, ability or that mechanism, that structural me mechanism to involve more uh, stakeholders resonate as uh, something that could be beneficial? You know, that's, that has been required of federal activities in, in the areas of uh, capital programs, mostly by NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act since 1969. But even more so, once agencies got uh, better acclimated with it, uh, when I was later on in the Department of Energy, we would often have meetings. We, we have standing uh, groups of citizens in the areas where the Department of Energy has sites that meet and advise the local site manager and there's also a standing board of citizens to advise the head of the program. Uh, these boards uh, are separate from meetings with Native American nations, for example, that are often adjacent to or nearby. So I think that it, it's really very uh, appropriate for any federal agency to, to take the leadership role of engaging with the communities that are involved, that are stakeholders and involved uh, they are our neighbors, they're our employees, they're the people that we affect on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't think we had to wait for this to happen. I think that this, this is something that a good leadership would have been doing for many years by now. Glad to hear that. I'll add to that too. I mean, I mean, the word sustainability has come up a couple times already in this conversation. And I think there's, there's actually a maturing around the understanding of the sustainability. And, and it does involve engagement with stakeholders, transparency and decision-making. Um, as Dorothy kind of highlighted, you know, we have a cash-based 
budget that really complicates making wise investment decisions in the out year. But the more that we can make it understood how, in, in Jim's point, uh, the ripple effect on the budget and, and how that can really ripsaw um, you know, sensible decision making. But if we're bringing that together um, and involving stakeholders and, that can understand these risks, articulate um, the trade-offs that are necessary to make it work, it, it's really critical. Um, th these are hallmark elements of the ISO 55000 view of disciplined asset management. Um, what is kind of unique about that series of standards and is complementary to ISO 9000 on quality management or 14,000 on environmental management. And there's many other management system standards out there, but ISO 55,000 requires what it calls a strategic asset management plan. Um, in, the, in the federal um, kind of vernacular, um, that's called a real property capital plan. So OMB M20 TAC 03 is advocating for the development of that other policies in, in OMB uh, A11 also support that. But what, it, what the essence of that is, is uh, requirements. So what stakeholders need the facilities to do to support their needs, budget, and how you know, the facility engineer is supporting that, or more broadly, the asset manager is supporting that, which involves financial specialists, um, you know, technology specialists, and so on, that everybody's bringing that to, uh, to a head in the strategic asset management plan. And through an iterative process, um, you know, groups of individuals are kind of figuring out how to make best use of limited funds and, and basically use that to communicate across the board. You know, back to the sustainability point, um, the understanding that the implications of this, um, you know, Jim made some great points with, um, you know, um, some of the Indian tribes and the relationship with the federal government and the interaction with that. We can think about uh, schools and how school support, you know, the broader community and, and, and the investments that have to go into schools and so on. I mean, the story goes on and on uh, across a whole bunch of different asset types. But if we can establish the means of communicating, sharing and understanding of risk and decisions, given limited resources, we're in a really good, good point. And, th and these are hallmark elements of what ISO 55000 brings to the table as far as a method of communication. And while we've been talking about ISO 55000, uh, Lindsay Ziegler from uh, ALN member uh, Andrew James Advisory Group uh, asked about requiring ISO 55000 of contractors. I'm going to twist that to a little different question. MAP 21 required an asset management plan in order for transit authorities to, to receive their funds. Should that be something that all federal funds, the disbursement of all federal funds require an asset management plan before you receive them? Uh, I'll kick something off, but I'm sure Dorothy and Jim have, 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 have something to, to follow up on this. I mean, I mean, the essence of kind of the beginning of, of ISO 55000 was really about that kind of public trust, you know, willing buyer, willing seller premise. If you're gonna float a bond uh, to support uh, capital investments, that the uh, return on investment of that um, is going to be paid for. I mean, the benefits uh, equal or exceed the, the investment, and how that how that happens. And I think um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, a public law order requires that. I think there's a little bit more that needs to be done in terms of federal policy. That uh, say, for instance, we have a strategic plan, a strategic asset management plan from a federal agency. The investments are going into these facilities. If we look out into the out year and we kind of score how well these investments have effectively achieved those objectives over time, I think we're going to see maybe a little bit of a different picture and we can learn from that. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the question you raised, Mike, is should we use the federal procurement system to try to drive um, deployment of asset management uh, thinking. And, yes. and I guess, in, in gen generally speaking, I'm a fan of using federal procurement uh, to try to do things. I mean, I think you're seeing a lot of that now with, uh, with climate. Um, and uh, the federal government is such a big buyer. I mean, the pro often the problem is federal procurement 
is so geared to first cost. So the idea of, you know, there's almost a, a, um, a dis disconnect between those two ideas. And I think one of the, I think it is important to try to drive federal procurement generally toward uh, thinking about total cost of ownership, social cost of carbon, some of these longer term things um, to get over the green premium and to get over other fir first cost issues that uh, make for less than ideal procurement. Um, so, so in general, yes, but I don't think, I, I think it, it may take a bigger change in the procurement system than just putting a clause in there requiring it. Yeah, uh, one of my mentors once said, uh, if you're ever having trouble uh, with the problem, make the problem bigger. <laughs> that gets people's attention and then there's focus on it, yeah. Jim, any uh, thoughts? Well, as with anything, you know, procurement does have a role to play. Uh, I come more from a background in the Navy where we were the contracting officers. And so, you know, we were able to choose the proper format of contract, whether it would be, you know, we, we would make the determination as the leaders of the program uh, as to whether we were looking to minimize first cost or if there were more points, for example, in the evaluation on reliability and, 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 and safety and things of that nature. So procurement was certainly a major part of it, but unlike uh, what I had previously experienced in other agencies in, 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 the, in the Navy civil engineering area, which is facilities, uh, we were the contracting officers. So it was kind of integral to what we did. And that was a big advantage. That is not the case in all agencies. For example, uh, in, in the Air Force, the, the, uh, the facilities managers do not include the procurement capability organically. It's a separate standalone organization at base level. So again, not all agencies are the same. We, we tend to think we can come up with solutions that apply to all, but as we, as we learn as we go, there are many differences between the agencies are structured uh, and thus have to operate. There's ways to learn from the, the other uh, agencies. Uh, Jack Dempsey helped me understand that the Air Force considers their facilities part of their weapon system. And then that brings it to the level of service that Dorothy was talking about, that yeah. the asset is a service. Uh, yeah. Jack, any ideas on, or, or uh, Dorothy, any ideas on that? Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, that is the, the Air Force refrain. We fight from our bases. Um, and their bases, you can tell. I mean, they their bases are pristine. I mean, the Air Force really takes care of its bases. The Navy, not so much because, you know, they're out, out in ships all the time. They don't care so much about their shore facilities. And the Army means well, but doesn't have enough money to, to keep them up. So, so yeah, there is there is something to be to be said for that. I think um, I can't remember now that the, the uh, did I answer the question? Yes. Yes, okay. actually, Sorry. expertly. Yeah, thank you. Jack, you want to make any comment there? I, I think it really kind of comes down. To, I mean, one of the things I've, I've learned, become fond of saying, I mean, th this stuff is easy, except for the people. And it, and it comes down to communications. And I think that that's really important. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, mounting um, uh, limitations of a deferred maintenance backlog have been lamented for, for years and decades. Um, with, with little impact in terms of outcomes, what, what I find striking when you take a step back is somehow the mission still gets done. So I think there's, there's a balance point that has to be figured out. I mean, the engineer kind of, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm an engineer myself, you know, is trained to think kind of more in absolutes and there's a safety factor of how to, to make some adjustments. But when you get down to, you know, operations, dynamic environments, uh, risks, um, climate change, for example, you, you have to kind of start thinking about trade-offs and it's a different type of equation. So um, even though we have huge and very um, clear deferred maintenance backlogs, so, somehow the mission's getting done. And I think really the optimization is going to be, you know, how can we communicate across different stakeholder groups, understand the trade-offs of our investment decisions. I mean, hopefully, um, you know, getting in the direction of 
understanding capital investments and managing things from a capital perspective, i.e. working capital funds is a good example, um, will, will help us overall make better decisions and ultimately um, better serve the American public. Excellent. Uh, Cameron, you started off with an excellent uh, uh, listing of uh, activities of uh, Federal Facility Council and the Board on Infrastructure and Constructed Environment. Are there anything uh, else you want to point us to uh, about your upcoming activities or things that you would like uh, agencies to get involved with? Well, I would always invite the agencies to um, participate in the Federal Facilities Council. We do have 24 uh, member agencies, uh, basically all federal agencies that manage and operate facilities are, are welcome to, to, to join and participate. The sponsors of the Federal Facilities Council, the, the, the agencies that pay annual dues, direct the work that we do. So they, and, and I think that's the important aspect of the Federal Facilities Council is the work is driven um, by accumulating small amounts of sponsorship through a number of agencies, and then they direct the work from for the National Academy. Uh, what the National Academy is, is capable of doing is bringing to bear its um, network of scientists and engineers um, and, and economists and, and, it, and all the, 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 the brilliant minds of this country together to help, um, uh, to help solve issues and, and, and uh, identify uh, agendas and paths forward for the, 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 the federal government or the, the people of the country to, to move forward. Um, you know, the academies exist to support and advise the, the federal government and, and is dealing with broad national issues right now, like climate change, like public health, like food security, supply chain issues, and social issues. All of those main issues have, have, have a, an infrastructure component to them. Um, and it's recognized for, for infrastructure then, it's none of those broad national issues are infrastructure. They don't, even though we just passed the an infrastructure bill, and that has been the news, the political news for a while, is whether the infrastructure bill is going to get passed and what form it is. None of the broad issues that are facing the country say, you know, directly infrastructure of the ones I described. However, they have a component in there, and it's through something like an asset management um, approach where the facility, the infrastructure itself, uh, is part of the value in, in the solution to um, those issues. At the same time, we can talk about infrastructure as its own uh, broad national issue. We have decaying infrastructure, whether it's federally owned, state owned, privately owned, um, which poses a public health risk. It poses a risk to our supply chain as we're, as, as we're seeing. Um, it poses national security risks, and so it creates a lot of risk to have decaying infrastructure. So the lack of investment in our infrastructure um, over time is increased risk. And so recognizing those risks and, and um, participate in, in infrastructure itself becomes one of those broad national issues. Um, so for, for any of the federal uh, audience that are on, I would say, please, um, please go ahead and look up the, the Federal Facilities Council. Uh, it's easy just to, to Google that or to go to um, national nas.edu forward slash FFC um, and see, uh, get in contact with us if you wanna know how to participate, uh, if you wanna be involved. Um, we want to take direction from what are the issues, how can we support uh, the federal agencies in the management of the infrastructure that it owns. Excellent. So uh, I could talk uh, with you all day if we were in person. This would be moving to a, uh, a pub uh, or some other place for an adult beverage uh, later on. But uh, uh, I, I just want to say thank you. It's an honor uh, to be involved in discussions with all of you. And I started off by uh, thanking uh, our uh, director of technology, 
Nick Kenoki, and uh, I would like to end by saying this is all happening because of Jim Dieter, who is the CEO of the ALN, and we've promoted him to panelists. And if you would uh, uh, like to uh, make some comments uh, about uh, what you've been hearing and what uh, uh, you'd like to see us doing more with the National Academies or whatever you want to say, Jim. Well, thanks, Mike. But I think it's it's really all the people out there and uh, our organizational members and uh, the senior fellows and uh, you know a great relationship uh, that thanks to uh, Jack Dempsey that we've developed over the years with Cameron and the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, I think it's you know all of this is working together to to create what we're all looking for, and that's to. Uh, propel these considerations uh, you know, to the forefront of people's minds. I always say that when the asset management standard 55,000 was passed in 2014, we thought, wouldn't it be great if uh, you know, CEOs knew what asset management was and senior leaders in the government knew what asset management was on a general basis? Uh, you know, like one, you know, one little article in Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal. And now I don't think it's hard to imagine a senior executive uh, that isn't aware of asset management, uh, certainly to do with the, a great variety of uh, different, uh, different depths of knowledge. But uh, the couple notes I had made maybe to, to, to mention briefly, you know, is there's a breadth question of, so how do we get more people up to speed on the really great stuff we saw today and you know, on this great uh, event that Mike, and I, I have to say, if we're giving kudos, I have to stop and give kudos to Mike because this entire fall event was 99% uh, Mike uh, driving. driving no, it wasn't. It. No, it wasn't. But anyway, <laughs> thank you. Uh, anyhow, it was. So uh, uh, just some great, uh, some great panels <laughs> and discussion. So you have the breadth question. How do we get more people involved? And Cameron was talking to that. Uh, but then he also segued to talking about, you know, so what can we do next? What do you want us to do? And uh, I think that's where we're focused on an ALN perspective is particularly on, on that leadership, you know, us trying to take a leadership role in any way we can, working with others uh, in our events to propel it forward. And I have to go back to Admiral Allen's uh, uh, opening speech today uh, every time I think of that, I just picture a Coast Guard cutter charging through the water, going to complete its mission. You know, it's like, hey, get on or get out of the way. You know, we're going to do it. And I think a lot of what I'm hearing here is uh, the Federal Facilities Council, the BICE, uh, Jack Dempsey's efforts, some of our organizational members like Definitive Logic and others are charging forward. And I my sense of where we are this year, which has seemed to take giant steps forward every year, is that now our mission is to charge forward and show people the success and the difference that these programs make. Uh, you know, you know, the example, simple examples like the, uh, you know, the military housing uh, are the kinds of things that we can get people thinking in a new way uh, and make a difference. And, uh, we see that asset management is a, is a core part of organizational thinking and provides that structure that not only, you know, solves the problems that we have today, but prepares people to uh, anticipate and solve the problems uh, that we have yet to identify. So thank you all. And one way I think uh, we can uh, do that is uh, um, we are committed to uh, helping publicize and promote uh, the findings in the study that Jack has been talking about. So as soon as we can, uh, probably at the beginning of next year, uh, we wanna have a extensive uh, look at that document and try to help people understand how to take the uh, insights and education knowledge in that and apply it. Absolutely. Can't so, if people would like to make closing statements, uh, Jack Dempsey, uh, can we start with you? 
Well, I'm, I'm going to, you know, kind of jump on the, uh, you know, uh, thank you, ALN. Uh, I mean, really do appreciate the leadership that you're showing here and the forums that you're providing. Um, it, it's quite an honor to, to be uh, a member of this panel and uh, really look forward to um, what's going to be happening next in terms of asset management. I really do think there's a growing appreciation of it as a discipline of thought, something that's going to be helpful in very basic and impactful ways and look forward to seeing how, how that can ripple effect across uh, the federal government, particularly, and, uh, and how that can basically support the nation and, and, and the prosperity that we, uh, we all seek. Excellent. And, and Jim, this is the second time you've uh, presented. First time was at the actual National Academies. Thanks for coming back and, and joining us again. Uh, would you like to make any closing statement? Uh, just a quick uh, acknowledgement and, and thank you to both organizations, the, uh, the National Academies and Cameron and, and uh, the Asset Leadership Network for continuing this relationship. You know, we, we each have members and constituents and stakeholders, and I, I can see no downside at all by the type of collaboration that we're doing today. I think it's really a very positive experience for, for, for me, and I'm sure for the panelists, as well as those who watched uh, and, and participate with questions and so forth. So thank you. Thank you. And, and Dorothy, I got to say, you are a pistol. You're, oh. you're, you're my favorite new <laughs> panelist. We've got to get you on our ALN Thursday at three and have some more discussions with you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I was just sitting here thinking, boy, I was really not, <laughs> not, uh, not. Oh, no, no. You were okay. spot okay. on. We okay. love it. Okay. Okay, good. All right. So closing thoughts, I just, uh, climate and COVID, I think too, uh, will be game changers for um, federal asset management. I hope they, they will. I think, I think post COVID, it should, I mean, this should, we are not going back the way uh, to the, to the way it was. Broadband worked, you know, it's Zoom worked. It's, it's amazing. And so it, it this, this should really transform um, federal asset, federal property management. We, the federal government needs less, even less stuff than it did before. I hope to see major change. It will invariably take longer in the public sector than the private sector. Congress will, you know, require federal employees to be there more than they need to be in the office. But, um, but that, that to me is the big elephant in the room. And then I think, um, I think climate in, uh, in the Biden administration is creating an opportunity for uh, agencies to get funding for their facilities. We'll see how much of that, some of that, uh, we'll see uh, how much of that actually makes it through uh, Build Back Better. But I, I am hopeful that in the service of, 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 of deploying innovative technology that federal facilities will get some much needed funds as they did with ARA, but on an even bigger scale than, than they did 10 years ago. Okay, thank you. And I, I will be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron, would you like to uh, uh, make the closing statement? Yeah, so I'd like to thank ALN for, for putting these together and for a continued partnership in, in areas of ground asset management, which of course the Federal Facilities Council is interested in. The, the report that has been alluded to a number of times is called a strategy to renew federal facilities. We were really hoping to have it released ahead of this, this, this uh, engagement today, but unfortunately uh, we are working um, still to make it even better and to be impactful. Uh, the report's simple objective is to help to ensure that every facility dollar is spent effectively and efficiently and supports and improves agency mission. Um, and that's, that's the simple objective. That's a simple objective of a lot of our reports and the simple, uh, you know, broadly a simple objective of the Federal Facilities Council is if the federal government, like Dorothy said, has the biggest portfolio of infrastructure in the world, how can we better help manage that? Um, and in, in the Federal Facilities Council case, it's the installations and the facilities uh, and areas of technology in policy and in process improvement. 
Great. That's a, that's a great way to end. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you to our audience. Uh, thank you to our patron members and to our organizational members. And uh, everybody, uh, have a good rest of your day. Great. Thank you.